for joining this session. This session is basically on fundraising strategies for startups. Uh, we have divided this session in two plans. We'll be giving first 45 minutes towards fundraising strategies. So this will be overarching strategy plan on how should you fundraise? How should you prepare your deck? Who should you reach out to? What should be your overall plan? What should your business look like uh, when you go to fundraise in the, in the market? And uh, I mean, do you really need to raise funds uh, to start with? So we'll be covering overall strategy in the first 45 minutes, and then we will be going into term sheet uh, fundamentals in the next 45 minutes. I have my colleague here, uh, Darren Lobo, who is co-hosting the session with me. Hi, Darren, and welcome to you as well. Uh, he'll be taking the second half of the session. Uh, both Darren and I are a part of investment team of Avishkar Capital. I'll give you a quick snippet of who we are before we move forward. Uh, let's try to make it an interactive session. Uh, I think the best way to pose your questions would be on the chat. So feel free to post anything you want. Uh, we'll try and cover it in our conversation here. Uh, we would like to make the session intimate and informal. So, you know, just shoot anything that comes on top of uh, your mind. There are no wrong questions here and it helps us learn as well in some ways. So, um, so with that, um, also uh, last point, do keep yourselves on mute. Uh, if possible, do keep your videos also on mute uh, due to bandwidth constraints at certain locations. Uh, with that, I think we can uh, begin our uh, session. Um, so Darren and I, uh, we are part of Avishkar Capital. Uh, we are co-hosting uh, the session here. Uh, Avishkar Capital is one of the oldest impact funds which has interest in Africa and Asia. We are about $400 million AUM strong. Uh, we have been there for a while. We are on our sixth cycle. We are on our sixth fund right now. We've made about 70 investments, made around 32 exits. Um, and most of our investments so far have uh, been in seed stage. So um, we, we kind of understand uh, this sector uh, quite well, have matured uh, in the impact investing industry over the last two decades. Um, also, while we were evaluating the deal, we get about 1,000, uh, 1,200 deals every year. And while looking at these deals, we, we organically came to a conclusion that a lot of the deals are rejected. Uh, because of wrong fundraise strategy and no major serious fundamental problems in the invest in the founder or the business model or the market. So basically, they, we are the wrong investor for them. They, I mean, we, we invest in something, they are coming for something else. There is communication mismatch, or mandate mismatch, etc. So that's where we thought that it's a, let's let's prepare a session for early stage founders and and you know kind of. Um, uh, share the insights which we have generated over the last years of uh, our operations in uh, in venture capital financing with the prospect founders. So um, so that led to genesis of this session. Uh, this is our third version. We've we've already taken actually fourth version. We've taken two master classes in Nairobi and one in uh, Mumbai last year. Uh, so we are also evolving. Would be grateful for your feedback after the session. So yeah, um, just to, to set a context, uh, while this is a classroom session, we'll try to give you as much insight as possible. First insight is um, equity fundraising is more about EQ than IQ. It is more like a marriage. It has a lot of similarity on how you go about looking for prospect marriage. There is quoting involved. Sometimes the first meeting is great and then you lose interest. Sometimes you take a lot of meetings to you know, figure out whether you're compatible or not. So whether I like this person, whether our expectations match, whether I can trust this person play as much a role in investors in taking a decision on the investment as the analysis and the IQ part. So I think from founder's perspective, it's very important to uh, absorb this and have the, and build the mental resilience to play this game. And we'll show you how to play this game in the best, in the best way we can. All right. So first thing first, uh, I'm sure every, 
all of you know about this. Um, these are the main categories of early stage investors available in the market right now. Um, starting with angel investors, without going into too many details here, these are typically people uh, who do investment from their personal capital. They are usually experts in domains and uh, look for uh, people or businesses in specific sectors. Uh, they are passionate. Uh, they, they put their own money. They are very, very flexible. So if you're really, really early in market, uh, these guys are probably the right people for you to reach out to. The next one is venture capital and seed funds. Uh, these are very, very institutionalized funds. They are very clear with their strategy, what they want, what they'll do, what they won't do. They are not as flexible usually as the angel investors. So they will ask for certain serious rights. Uh, their involvement will be high. Uh, also, they, they will uh, have very strong strategic intent and expectations on returns and then they get their money back. However, both these two categories are extremely high risk taking. They love creating the you know next big thing uh, uh, for the decade, etc. So uh, if if you are a big visionary, you want to change the world, so on and so forth. These two categories would probably find you interesting. Next is obviously debt providers. Now debt, as you all know, are extremely extremely low risk guys. Uh, if your business is profitable, small, has sustainable growth and consistent growth then probably it's good to go for debt uh, providers. Uh, then there are larger equity funds. Uh, they, they look for mature companies. For them, profitability is of extreme importance. So uh, it comes into play only when you've reached a certain stage um, in your maturity level. Um, next for early stage companies, I think it's very important and ignored by a lot of uh, 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 startups is the grant providers. There are a lot of government forums and agencies and even accelerators, um, you know, foundations, etc., which help uh, in promoting seed level uh, companies who have no business model uh, in innovative sectors. So this is also another great area which can be explored. However, I would say the most important of this all is friends, family, and your savings. When you're just starting out, um, it's it's the people who trust you, who know you, uh, who know that you'll do a good job, who know that you'll keep their money safe, who who can, you know, who are, when you know, close their eyes and uh, say that this is the guy who I want to put my money on, uh, are the right people uh, to go to. So, uh, so I mean, uh, to prove this, uh, this is one of the graph, uh, global graphs that we have. Personal savings and friends and family is actually the highest uh, uh, capital uh, source which has gone into early stage companies uh, it, it makes sense to put in your money to validate uh, your and your business model do some kind of proof of concept and then go to a venture capital instead of going to a venture capital right in front of uh, right up front uh, it makes for a better business case when you tell that hey i've put in my own money and see where i've come using my limited capital and i want to use your capital to grow it further it just creates more weight to your story uh, Moving forward, so these questions were asked by uh, uh, one of the founders in our portfolio company who I really admire. Um, a lot of times uh, when, when founders in their very initial days decide about raising capital, uh, they, didn't, they don't do a lot of soul searching. Uh, as I said earlier, raising capital is as much of a mental game and a game of mental resilience as of IQ. Uh, these are a few questions you should ask yourself. Number one, do I need to raise this capital? Like, do I really need it? Uh, why am I doing this? Am I doing this because I want uh, to be validated somehow? Am I doing this because of peer pressure? I, am I doing it because I don't want to leave a job because uh, uh, unless I have extra money, I, I, do, I just want to play safe. Um, so just, there are no right answers. There are no wrong answers, but... I think these are the questions you should ask yourself uh, before you go to market. Another very important question is, uh, what will I do if I don't raise this capital? What is my plan B? Um, deciding, I mean, how, how after six months, if, uh, if my idea or my plan is not able to attract money, uh, how will I move forward? Uh, a very decent plan B is even to say that, hey, maybe you know i'll shut this business down go back to work and probably look for some other idea what worse can happen uh having a plan b in mind 
helps you when you're negotiating and talking to investors what what's the worst that can happen right you will not get the money that's it you you learn from the experience and move on to become a uh, better from that experience so these are some questions you should ask yourselves before you go to market uh now that we've discussed whether you should go to market or not and who are the possible investors how do you start deciding which investor you should reach out to there are thousands of investors right now literally if you include angels vcs fees or debt providers i mean there there are lots and lots of places uh, and it really doesn't make sense to just sporadically go anywhere and everywhere it it makes a lot of sense to clearly think through who are you and who will value you and then go to market so this is uh, this is uh, something that we have created kind of a mind map for you to evaluate yourself and then see who's the right investor for you uh, so these are three main criteria so evaluate yourself on whether you are very high on promoter quality whether you're very high on business model validation you know i've already reached certain scale and i'm doing really well or whether you're really high on market i am in a very you know sunrise market which is going to do really well when i say promoter quality what i mean is so uh, a lot of times so um, i'll take an example here in india there's something called cure fit uh when the two promoters in this case decided they want to start a new company without even a clear business model in mind they had capital lined up that's because they were uh, very high on promoter quality which was because they had already uh, you know created a startup called mintra sold it and made a lot of money to investors so they were running very high on promoter quality and when they i mean for them it's, it was not that difficult initially they decided and there was money but then a lot of cases in a lot of cases uh, you are probably right out of college or you are right out of your job and you have not yet built that credibility in that case uh, play on the other two uh, either validated business model which is take capital initial capital from personal savings finance etc validate your model so show that hey guys uh, you know i started two years back uh, look at my numbers i'm at already at you know x y uh, z revenue i'm uh, making great unit economics so on and so forth so have a look at me you should be strong in this and if both of these are not matching maybe bullish on market go to investors who are looking for these specific markets um i'll give you another example for this uh, i i think six months back uh, i met two promoters 20 year old uh, they were working on a very innovative satellite launch company which had never been done before uh, so they were and and they were working on something absolutely new so uh, ultimately all the three weights you're seeing here promoter business model bullish and market all that were zero for them however they ended up raising 2 million dollars so i was quite curious that you guys are just out of market doing something nobody else has done it before your market is not understood it doesn't exist how did you manage to raise 2 million that was 6 months back right now they've raised 5 million and they they gave me an interesting strategy and i'm going to share it here uh, what they did was uh, being specifically went to investors who are you know the third point bullish on market so what they did for the initial capital they went to founders of x space technology companies who understood the sector really well and who were actually looking for founders to do something new and path breaking so they were already aware of the sector they understood the business and as soon as they found these two guys and they were like hey yeah you are the guys we wanted uh, you know uh, i was looking for you let me put money in you uh, so they they raised capital from angel investors who were actually experts who understood the market really well who were ready to take that bet then using this capital they validated the business model and then finally went to venture capital institutions like avishkar capital with a validated business model so by the time they come came to us they already had their numbers aligned see we are already doing well we might be 21 year old you might not understand our market but we were we are already showing the numbers to you on paper so uh, it's it's important to know you know like in any consumer product also what's your product proposition what does your you know market want and play on that so uh, again this is more of not there's no science to it this is more of a art uh, to to find these things out do your soul searching and play it well in your favor and this is uh, one of the ways you can probably think about how to approach your storytelling
uh, another thing uh, i think for early stage uh, investors this is uh, founders this is one of uh, the important areas uh, when you're a founder it's important to know that um, when you're going to raise capital into the market uh you are more of a marketing person so so you need to really put a marketing hat on rather than a business manager and a ceo or a ceo hat on which essentially means if you are going to market your company which in this case is the product and uh, want to sell your company to investors who are your consumers it is important for you to know what does your customer want what does an investment investor want uh why am i talking to you what is my intent here so these are the three areas which an investor wants and ultimately whatever questions they are asking about you your background your uh your capability your business your your plan your future it all comes down to these three points which is number one to make money so at the end of the pitch or you know the, the crux of the entire pitch should always hint towards hey guys i'm going to you know really get you a great return you have a great investment here you'll miss out if you don't listen to me so uh, the indication on or the the, the overlay of the whole uh, conversation should be that uh, their their your money will be back you know that your money will be back uh, here's the plan for getting your money back uh, and this is a great investment for you uh, next point is every investor has a mandate especially institutional investors not so much with angels uh, they they know what kind of sectors they are looking at they'll have their ticket sizes in mind they know what kind of stages they are looking for uh, it's important for you to, to to do this homework before you shortlist your investors uh, as i said earlier we get 1000 deals every year and uh, a lot of them uh, come to us which have major mismatches on sector ticket size or stage so basically there's a lot of time spent uh, on things which which don't even meet our uh, you know uh, broad criteria um, and from founders point of view also instead of going to you know 200 different people uh, it makes a lot of sense to go to 50 right people have the right conversations with them so it's important that you do your homework on the funds before you go to market um, also last uh, exit uh, the if you, if you look at india's uh, uh, venture capital industry in the last 10 years um uh, the, the need and the uh, focus on what kind of exit your business can generate has increasingly uh, become more and more important and we'll touch upon this in a bit later uh, earlier this never used to be one of the core questions but right now this is one of the core questions which investors are going to ask you and you'll have to uh, have some depth in your preparation in this aspect as well uh, so this is what an investor is looking at overall and this is what your overall pitch should hint towards um while while uh, while you when you decide who to go to uh, we'll and we'll discuss here how should you pick an investor for yourself um our suggestion is to actually make a, a priority list of investors make a list of priority one investors priority two priority three so on and so forth so, and it makes a lot of sense to go to probably priority priority two investors first because it will help you in understanding where you're going wrong what kind of questions are they asking what kind of uh, questions should you prepare for what are your blind spots which are not understanding and then go to your priority one investors with you know with a hard solid experience of pitching this is just a one random thought uh, which uh, we recommend our portfolio companies to uh, to employ and it, it really helps uh, after fourth or fifth pitch you'll realize that your um uh, practice uh, has really helped you in becoming more confident etc um so yeah next next uh, part is uh, uh, what should you look for in an investor so it shouldn't be one way street where you're trying to woo an investor trying to get the girl here uh, you also need to see who you are what are your expectations and uh, what do you want from this investor so these are some of the things that you should you know keep an eye on when you're talking to investors so that you don't get into the wrong relationship and then regret later which happens um the first thing is uh, fund details um uh, we discussed already the matches and ticket size etc um one important thing you should look at is um, does the fund a lot of follow follow on investments 
which essentially means if you're doing well and you're out of cash in a year, will they come and support you at that point in time? What, what kind of strategy do they have? Do they have a background of investing in their companies uh, to support them till the culmination of their you know, return of investment? Um, the other thing uh, and the most important thing here, which is overlooked by many founders is whether this fund is open or closed. If it is a closed fund, it essentially means that uh, you will have to return the capital back in seven or 10 or whatever year uh, the fund uh, tells you, uh, which essentially means you will have to start your exit planning for your investor by year five, so on and so forth. Uh, so are you ready for that? Uh, is your company ready for that? Are you, are you too new? Uh, are you too young? Uh, do you even want to uh, start focusing on investor exits or even selling your companies by year four or five? So, uh, so this is something you should look at. Then there are funds which are open-ended as well. These are usually corporate-backed funds or they may be, they may be foundation-led funds. Uh, maybe if, if you feel that you won't be able to give an exit in five, six years, it makes sense to go to more open funds who will not who will give you more time. There are more patient funds who, who will you know stay with you for a longer duration of time. So it's it's your call. It's, it's something which you need to uh, that you need to decide. Also, another thing uh, you need to know when you are getting into a fund. So if if a fund is in its year three or four, um, and it's a ten-year fund, it essentially means you'll have to give an exit in the next you know uh, four to five years which is very less time. Uh, as against a fund which is in its year one, uh, you'll get more time to validate, prove, scale your business uh, and return the capital to the investor. So this is another question you should ask your investors, uh, which year of fund are you in? When do you look for an exit from me? And see if that's actually practical for you. Don't make false promises. Um, next is portfolio companies. I think uh, going through portfolio companies of uh, investors, uh, gives a lot of in insights on how investor these investors invest. Uh, it's, 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 it makes a lot of sense to see if you have any major competitors there or any major prospect clients or, 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 or sourcing partners, etc. Are there any synergies? So on and so forth. Uh, next is background of the investor team. Uh, my personal view is uh, when you're evaluating an investor, instead of going with the brand of the investor, focus more on who is the partner you will be working with in that fund. Uh, because you will be with that partner for a long period of time, they'll be on the board, etc. So it's important to see whether you tune well with the partner of the fund and whether they tune well with you, rather than just going with the brand name of the fund. I, I would even go to the extent by say, uh, to an extent where where I, I'll say that uh, if you feel that you have a great connection with a partner, uh, you might want to even forego some level of valuation to get the right person on board. It, it makes a lot of sense to get the right thinking of minds uh, when you're looking for uh, investors. And then the other thing you need to keep an eye on, and maybe uh, this is another question you should ask investors when, when you're talking to them is, what kind of interventions do you have? For? Are you a silent money or are you a value money? Uh, silent money essentially means that um, the investor will put in money in you and then forget. They'll call you up five years later and uh, how new till they get their money back. So this is this kind. There is this kind of investor. So if you if you like autonomy, if you know what you're doing, if you, if you don't really uh, want a lot of involvement from investors, maybe go for these guys. But then there are a lot of value investors. Uh, who will work with you, who will help you build your business, who will be with you uh, on, you know, phone call, uh, discuss business with, with you, uh, uh, pivot, help you pivot when things are going wrong, uh, be your sounding mode, etc. So their involvement uh, in your business would be relatively high. So if you're somebody who wants that kind of support and assistance and nurturing, then those are the right funds for you. Uh, so this is another area you should consider before you decide uh, who to go to. Um, next, as I said, uh, there are multiple uh, kinds of funds. There are LP backed funds wherein they have to really return the capital back. They are highly institutionalized. They have a lot of bylaws, uh, not so flexible, but uh, uh, 
uh, at the same time you have a lot of corporate funds hni funds uh, these are typically not uh, uh, you know they don't have a boundary on when the money should be returned but they will also come with some caveats a lot of times corporate funds uh, come with a caveat that hey you will make a dv with our company or uh, uh, you know we would want something i mean there's this every fund comes with their set of um uh, lack of flexibility options and uh, plus points so just uh, uh, evaluate the negatives and the positives of each fund see where you are at what you want from the uh, fund and then move forward uh yeah so uh, now that you know what kind of investors are there uh, uh, who is the right investor for you uh, you know that you want to raise capital and it makes sense for you right now uh how do you know what's the right time to go to market um one thing i want to emphasize here is is that um there is it's it's extremely dangerous to go too soon to market you should go to market when you are completely ready when your investor when your uh, company is ready when your investor pitch and storyline is rock solid it makes sense uh then only you should go to market uh, it's it's very dangerous to go with half baked concept or half baked preparation so on and so forth these are some areas uh, which uh, you should have uh, some validity on before you go to investors there should be some proof of concept some proof of product market fit uh some a business model uh, which has been demonstrated to some extent uh, uh, and is convincing there has to be a proper future plan in place uh, team is very important even in early stages at top level have you got uh, good people on top do you have the capability to extract talent from these from big companies and uh, people who have flush jobs to leave that for you and join you so do you have that kind of star power as as a as a founder um, so these are some of the things that you should look at before you go to uh, market uh, people often ask us uh, when should they go to market uh, there is no a scientific rule for this but our uh, suggestion is always uh, go to market 12 months before you cash out uh, the time taken to find the right investor uh, due diligence negotiations etc usually takes about 6 to 8 months again no rules there are many many exceptions uh, here um, however uh, just keep a decent buffer because if 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 you go too late to market say maybe 6 months before you run out of cash uh, by the end of it you will be mentally uh, and financially in such a desperate position that your pitching your confidence etc would would be would be shaken right uh, so and also uh, you your back will be against the wall your negotiating negotiating position would also diminish to a large extent uh, so it's it's good to have a decent buffer of cash when you go to market so that you don't end up in that situation um again uh, uh one of the most important thing uh, especially in early stage fundraising is building your network uh, and really not just getting connected but actually building relationships investing time creating that relationship equities with your friends friends of friends founders who are in similar sector investors angels so on and so forth and you can start doing that way way ahead of uh, going to market formally to raise capital uh, you should have a decent network already in place where there are people who admire you who are passionate about you who want to refer you because they like you so much um you know that should be done before you go to market for raising capital uh and these are some ways uh, in which you sh- you can reach out to possible investors um so i've i've surveyed a lot of investors and asked them what is the most common way for getting uh, a deal for you is it is it on the in your web website is it through some referral from your friends or colleagues or investment bankers or uh, strangely the answer that i get most most frequently is linkedin uh, so yes exploit linkedin to the fullest uh connect in, uh i've seen most most investors uh in fact almost everybody i know are extremely active on linkedin it's it's their job to source uh, source as many deals as possible right so don't be shy connect with people on linkedin reach out to them uh having said that it makes a lot of sense to get referrals as well 
uh, so at times it's a good idea to connect with probably portfolio companies of those funds and use them to refer you um also there are some signaling which 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 work well in your favor which is uh, which can be things like uh, having decent people on your board uh, who are actually reputed members it, it, so you know it signals that okay these guys uh, are solid they, they, they've got a very reputed person on the board or you can uh, get yourself enrolled to some premium premium uh, uh, accelerators incubators etc which kind of gives you that you know little thought that hey uh, you know somebody has looked at them they have liked them uh, before you go to your investors for fundraise um yeah so this is another question we are asked a lot of time uh, which is how much you should uh, raise uh, well i can give you a very scientific answer based on business model etc for a late stage company but for a early stage companies it's uh, it's mainly these couple of factors uh, we suggest that you should raise your uh, fund keeping in mind your runway for at least 2 years which essentially means if you're going to be loss making for next couple of years uh make sure that you're covering for your losses for at least 2 years uh and then so that you have enough time between two fundraises if you cover losses only for one year then you'll have to be in market way too soon if you cover losses for 3 years I mean that's that's still okay um then stage of the company it really depends if you if you really really new going and getting a 5 or 10 million dollar check might not really make sense so just think of where you are before you get that first check uh next is valuation and dilution um uh yeah so what kind of valuation are you getting and how much do you want to dilute a, a lot of times that decides the amount of capital you can raise again these are very uh you know kind of uh, rough guidelines Uh, but these are some areas you can consider when you are looking at how much you should raise um but here just a quick thought on valuation um when you are discussing valuation with uh, or with your potential investors uh there are two things to keep in mind uh one what happens if the valuation is too high and what happens if the valuation is too low uh usually a higher valuation is considered great right a founder which gets you know 2 million dollars in their early stage at a great valuation say you know 20 million is is considered good you you did only 10% dilution and you get you got a decent decent deal for yourself uh, however it is quite dangerous to get overvalued in early stages uh, and i'll tell you why because you'll have to go to market again in 2 years um, and you will have to show an uptick in your valuation later you can't go down so a lot of times if a company gets overvalued in its initial days and which is possible the initial days the valuation is not really scientific uh getting your second fundraise might become a little difficult so uh, keep in mind that you're not getting overvalued also uh you know if you're valued at a seed stage say you got a valuation of 100 crore you got a very great investor who had a lot of uh you know passion for you uh but when you go to market for the second time and go to vcs etc they see your business they say hey your turnover has not really increased in the last two years you're too new i'm not going to give you 100 crore valuation and it, that's very dangerous you, you lose on uh, possible investors just because your initial valuation was way too high so the existence the very existence of the company becomes uh, a problem if you're overvalued to a massive extent in initial days so keep that in mind the second point which i was saying was extremely undervalued the danger of undervalue is that you will be giving a lot of equity to investors so basically if you are undervalued you will end up giving say 50% or 60% of your equity in your first round to your investor which really doesn't make sense in the long run because you'll have to go to market again and again and again and there has to be enough space for more investors to come in and you should in the cap table have enough equity to ensure that you are incentivized enough to keep working in the company so that you know that your financial returns are also being taken care of so if you end up giving a lot of valuation in initial days uh which and which gives you say a very minute equity by the end of second or third round uh it won't it will stop making sense for you 
so these are like it shouldn't be too highly valued it shouldn't be too low uh, dilution should be you know in that perfect range uh, where you are incentivized enough at the same time you won't shoo away possible investors because of o- being overvalued um moving on um just a second i hope i am uh, answering all your chat questions so all right uh, maybe i'll i'll pick some of those uh, later thank you uh next is how should you overall prepare for a fundraise um let me uh, give you a thought here uh, be over prepared uh, know everything that you can about your past about your numbers about your people uh, how much funds do you want to raise uh, where will this exact amount go have you identified areas of opportunity have you identified who you want to hire i mean be completely over prepared here uh, anticipate all kinds of questions an investor can ask uh, think of best ways to communicate uh, answers to those questions think of examples that you can share uh, i mean we've come across some you know founders who answered the most bizarre of our questions in a more you uh, know in the most articulate ways and that really that really shows you depth of that entrepreneur the understanding of the business and the passion they carry so so over prepared at the same time we've come across entrepreneurs where they didn't know their numbers so uh, we've i've come across an entrepreneurs where they didn't know the result of their pilot they didn't know how much money did they make in some pilot he was uh, you know proposing for which he was raising the funds actually and he had to call up his cfo so those are big knows don't uh, don't don't come to that situation know everything possible about your company you should be like in helm of everything uh, so yeah when you go about preparing uh, one is you prepare yourself and these are some of the things which we call the collateral um, uh, so you have to prepare three documents as such one is called the teaser one is the detailed information memorandum and the other is the business model a teaser is i would say out of all these teaser is the most important uh, one uh, most of the investors spend i think minute on a teaser and take the first call which is which is the most riskiest you know because that's when most of the deals are rejected in that one minute so a teaser should be extremely crisp it should be extremely clear the story that you are sh- sharing should be uh, should be very very easy to understand and the aim of it is pretty simple it's just trying to say you know hey i am a really attractive venture mr venture capitalist and i think you should have a look at me if you agree then let's talk so the purpose of a teaser is to get that one phone call and then you can take the show forward so keep that in uh, mind uh, there are various approaches to uh, tell a story in a teaser some of the do's uh, i would say is that uh, uh make it extremely articulate don't put a lot of words don't put a lot of explanation it should be extremely easy to understand and it should excite uh, uh, an investor uh you know i mentioned three points here uh i one of our portfolio companies is called agrostar and i i think uh theirs is the best teaser i've ever seen and i'll tell you why uh they led with the opportunity and the problem uh the story was hey there's a big problem uh in so this company is an alibaba of uh, uh, for the farmers it sells all things that farmers need uh so they led with an oppor- with the problem and the opportunity they said that hey you know these farmers they, they don't have access to the right fertilizers inputs etc because of xyz problems number 2 there are about 150 million farmers in the country who a lot of them have the money to pay and the market is huge three if somebody solves this problem there's a huge market to capture for this is how we've already solved the problem these are the numbers these are our repeat rates these are the customers these are our testimonials so very clear clear things big opportunity big problem and we've cracked it so put money in us and they did it in about 10 slides you don't need more than 10 slides to communicate a great story they use a lot of infographics or pictures of farmers so on and so forth and very very clips crisp and clear headlines and storylines uh so yeah i mean the job of a teaser is to really 
tight or uh, the the found uh, the, the investor sitting next to you um a uh, couple of uh, yeah these are some surveys most of the investors think your your teaser should be between 10 to 15 slides so if you if you're thinking of making making a 40 slider to give as much as information as possible don't do that uh, investors uh, don't have time they to skim through a lot of such teasers so keep it crisp and simple and easy to understand uh again preparation uh, as i already said uh, being articulate structured uh thinking deeply on what kind of uh, questions uh, would be asked what is the investor looking for am i answering those questions am i really telling them i'm the right guy to trust uh, trust so on and so forth is 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 something that you need to prepare know your numbers well uh, know what picture to uh, paint as i already said preempt all your questions yeah here's a some do not don't don't do these things here are here are, here are some of these points uh number 1 never bluff uh, you probably will be asked a question and uh, you would have probably no idea about that in that case it's it's okay to say that uh, you know uh, give me some time i'll get back to you i've not think about thought about it uh, it makes sense i think that's a great question i need to explore this it makes a lot of sense for, for you so it's okay to say that you don't know rather than bluffing uh, because i i'll tell you uh, in for the segment and the for the company that you're pitching uh i'm pretty sure that investor must have heard at least 10 such pitches so if they are asking you something uh assume that they know the background assume that uh they they know where they are coming from and if you bluff or give wrong answers it it really doesn't give the right impression so so never bluff, bluff never oversell uh next is don't make it a product pitch we see this especially in cases of inventors innovators scientists uh, they come up with great products products which are really solving a huge massive problem which make a lot of sense but for one hour of presentation they just end up talking about the product 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 i mean great you created a amazing product awesome uh, you know but how will this product generate money how will you go to market how will you sell this product who will consume this product uh, these are the points that are more important for an investor how much money are you planning to raise when will you deploy it so on and so forth so especially if if you think you are an innovator who has created a great product uh you know it will be good for you to train yourself on the business side of things when you go before pitch or probably find a co-founder you know who who already understands the business side of things and talks in that language when you go to investors and get you know gets you in only when the product has to be understood so this is an important point which we come across a lot of times uh, don't be afraid of being transparent if something has not gone right for you if you have failed if some product has failed if you lost your money in some uh, pilot that you were doing in your company it's absolutely okay to just accept it uh, uh, you know founders who show that level of authenticity and transparency uh i mean they, that that really shows the kind of maturity they carry uh, so it's important to accept all the defeats also uh, tell how, what you learned out of it and how you improved uh you know after that experience instead of saying hey i did everything perfect i've been a 100 on 100 all through my you know startup days uh don't engage in relative accounting we've come through this uh, uh be rest assured uh, investors do extremely detailed uh, due diligence after the time uh, sign the term sheet with you so they'll have all sorts of big fours open all your books and understand what you're doing so if you're showing numbers which are based on creative accounting or some kind of liberty here and there uh, it really it really doesn't make a, a good impression and just assume that it will come out either way one way or the other uh this actually happened with us uh we we were about to invest in a company great unit economics great numbers and it came out that there was some uh, you know creative accounting done it was highlighted by a big four um you know uh, in the end the promoter came apologized said that hey you know yeah i just you know did some numbers here and there uh you know in, at the end of the day what we were thinking was was we were okay with the worst numbers also it's okay if your you know margin is not 10% it's okay if it's 3% um, because we really like the promoter and the business what we were not okay was the breach of trust so uh, trust as i said initially also just like in marriage and dating trust becomes extremely important here and if there is a hint of distrust if there's a hint of thing that 
uh, you know i'm giving this you know as an investor i'm you know signing this 100 crore check for you or 10 crore check for you and even if there is a small pinch of distrust the investor will shy and back away because ultimately they'll do what 10 or 15 deals at the end and they are actually at that point in time looking for reason to reject because that's a lot of money to give to someone and a lot of high risk money um last uh, this community is small so don't bridge or uh, burn your bridges what i mean by this is if if you have multiple term sheets uh, and you have to reject uh, any term sheet do it with respect and dignity we've seen a lot of times uh, promoters just run away they don't know how to have that difficult conversation uh they you know just like in case of dating we find other girl you stop talking to the first one uh so don't don't do that uh, investors are matured a lot if you have a better deal etc means as i said relationship is very important maintain that equity have a very honest and open discussion in that uh, scenario as well because you never know how things go out in future maybe that investor you know you know leaves you at the last moment and you have to go back to your previous girlfriend i i don't know so don't burn your bridges uh, have good relations with all investors uh we are actually running short of time darren i'll take i think two more minutes before we move to term sheet part if that's okay yep yep sounds good go ahead thanks. julian what is yeah thanks so uh quickly taking you through the overall investment process as i said uh, earlier uh, you need at least 12 or you need uh, more or less 12 months uh, to raise capital and these 12 months would be split between finding an investor and once an investor is found uh, the the larger due diligence negotiation term sheet document signing process and this is how the process looks um the first step is obviously the investor will do a very 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 thorough due diligence on your commercial operations uh in this case uh, be rest assured they will go into anything and everything they deem appropriate so if you have any assumptions uh on your business model any pricing etc they they test everything they'll go to market they'll talk to experts uh they'll test every assumption that you've put on your business model so that's why when you create a business model ensure that you have enough backup uh to prove that um next is uh, next step is typically negotiations of key terms of term sheet and we'll go into this uh into it in detail in the next 45 minutes with darren uh once the detailed terms are agreed the investment team of that fund goes to the investment committee for uh, for an approval and only after that investment committee approves uh, uh you know the the fund is allowed to put in money but between approving from uh, investment committee and final closing final uh, you know uh, disbursement of capital uh, there is legal due diligence which is done by one of the legal guys there is financial due diligence uh, a thorough uh, you know term sheet discusses maybe 20 points an sha will have hundreds so a thorough negotiation of sha which is shareholders agreement share subscription agreement so on and so forth uh yeah so um so this is the last point and i would leave here uh, uh what are investors looking for in a promoter uh, vision and clarity of thought uh, early stage investors want game changers they want people who are going to disrupt things uh they want people with great temperament because the pressure uh, which a founder takes is is immense so we've seen founders really buckling down under pressure so does this guy have the temperament to take in that kind of pressure absorb it and still make a great company after all and these pressures could be internal within the company external market covid anything can happen so do you have the temperament and can you show it to the investor that i am you know mentally resilient to become a founder uh, uh rest of the points we've already discussed uh these are the exit routes this is becoming more and more important it's important to answer these questions with great depth when you are asked from investors and even you should not wait for asking you should tell them that how they plan how do you plan to return an investor's money back uh, do you think a secondary sale is possible do you think after 5 years you can sell your company to a big conglomerate in case you do who do you think are your right sellers why do you think they will buy you and what valuation can you get uh we, we are seeing now more and more promoters are coming with such uh, nuanced answers and responses to convince us that the company is really sellable and it makes sense for us to 
uh, put in money in their company uh, that's it uh, that's it from me you are uh, so raising funds is a mind game it's a war zone be prepared for some pain but the good news is you just need one investor you can go to 50 of them but you just need one yes so that's that's about it that's from me thank you uh, very much um i hope i have uh, uh answered most of your questions uh if i haven't uh, i happy to catch up uh, you know on a one on one etc there's just one yeah. thing maybe maybe to the is question how does one stay you know maintain that balance of uh, confidentiality as well as uh, trust when you're sharing you know information with investors in your pitch deck etc um and how does that one how, how does one manage that yeah i i think that's a tough one that's a tough one to balance especially when your product is based on proprietary information and that's your core value um i mean it's it's really a tough one to manage i would suggest um, uh be open be open to the investor all they are wanting to understand from you is number one uh, what you have created cannot be replicated very easily uh, number two it is very you know difficult to create not it will take at least three or four years for other guy to create uh, uh, number three it's not it's uncommon nobody else has done it so far so they, they are just looking for these uh, comforts uh, they want to be convinced that uh, you're not fooling them they want to be convinced that uh, uh, that uh, that you know this this value that you have created really makes sense for them uh, and for that you might need to go into some depth uh, as an investor i'm saying that uh, you your data will be confidential what you're saying will remain confidential investors have no uh benefit in sharing all that so my personal opinion as an investor is uh, you know focus more on building that trust with your investor so that they put in that money if you're able to do it without going into details great but if you have to then uh, then i would say that do it if you're comfortable that's 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 it all right thanks thanks divya so so guys let's let's sort of move to the term sheet session uh so this was a good insight into getting ready um for a fundraise and preparing for a fundraise and what do you need to do before you get uh, ready to sort of face investors how do you do your research but the eventual goal is to actually get some money or or raise capital from from investors right and and one of the first uh, sort of milestones for an for an early stage business is to actually get a term sheet uh, from an investor that is an expression of interest saying that uh, you know look I'm interested uh, and let's explore uh, how do we take this forward so so it's important to understand uh, what a term sheet is uh, just because it entails uh, the key terms of uh, that will govern your relationship with this particular investor going forward if the deal materializes all right so let me just share my screen with you and we can then start all right so is my is my screen sort of visible yes it is all right great all right so let's just get into it uh let's try and figure out what a term sheet what really is this this document it, it essentially is an agreement in principle right uh it's an it's a letter of intent that an investor gives to an entrepreneur saying that look i'm interested in this business uh and i want to sort of lay down a few terms that will govern our relationship going forward um and it's it's not really a binding agreement right it's not something that is legally enforceable it's just a few terms that the relationship that would be that would be taken forward through the definitive agreements the shareholders agreement set is the one term or one um, sort of point in the uh, in the term sheet that is is legally in 
enforceable. And that is the exclusivity clause. Uh, investors put in that clause in there so that they, they're not dealing with an enterprise hundred other investors um, that's actually you know not really committed to the process right so they they they, they ask exclusivity period and that period can range as well uh, and it also depends on the comfort the investor and the entrepreneur have with each other so there is there are instances where an exclusivity period can actually even go up for six months right and this is in cases where the investor and the entrepreneur are co-developing a business, um, putting the business plan together, putting the financial plan together, etc., and in that case, you know, the investor pretty obviously wants to to ensure that the the enterprise stays with them uh, and and the deal stays with them. So the exclusivity for for a transaction like that can be longer than can can be as high as six months, but in many cases it can. In, in, in general, it ranges from 30 to 60 days, right? Uh, it's, this is also a negotiation point. So almost everything in the term sheet is, is up for negotiation. And this is also up for negotiation. But as I said, in, in general, it ranges from 30 to 60 days. I'm getting a few questions in here, but uh, uh, let me just move on. Am I am I audible now? Hello. Um, Hello. Hi, Hello. Uh, just checking yeah. if I'm audible. Can you just? Am I am I audible or not? You keep cutting out. Okay. Um. Yeah. Is it better now? Though? Yeah. Yeah. Now. Now we can hear you. All right. Okay. Um. So. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I hope I'm I'm on the right connection, but uh, let's just move forward. Um, so what I was explaining earlier was was that the the term sheet is essentially a, a letter of intent. Uh, it's it's not a binding agreement except for the one clause that's around exclusivity, right? And and I mentioned why investors want exclusivity because they want some level of commitment from entrepreneurs. That they are committed to the process and, and, and the investors are certainly not wasting his or her time. Uh, what we'll do through this, to, through the presentation, is we'll go through a, a few key clauses in, in the term. Uh, there are a bunch of clauses, of course, that are outside of these, uh, but these are, these are key ones that uh, most entrepreneurs should understand. Um, and, 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 really, and, and really know what they're getting into, right? So these start from valuation, anti-dilution, affirmative rights, et cetera. So we'll go clause by clause, right? So the first one that you would find inside the term sheet is obviously uh, the valuation at which the investor is proposing to make the investment in the business. Uh, and, and obviously you'll see, you'll see two, uh, it broken down into pre-money valuation and post-money valuation. Uh, the pre-money is actually the value of the business as of today. That's before the investors actually put in money into the business. And the post-money valuation is, is pre-money plus the investment amount that's being raised. And so we had a question earlier on, on Early stage businesses, uh, these are the approaches. I've, I've put down a few approaches on the, on the right side, right hand side of the slide. Uh, there's the asset approach, the book value is, uh, approach, which is essentially used for uh, businesses that are in the, again, used for slightly matured businesses. Then, then there's the DCF approach, which is the income approach where you discount all the future values of, uh, of the cash flows of the business using a particular discount rate. Okay, I think my connection. Hello? 
let me just turn off my video if 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 that helps yeah sorry sorry about this i have no clue why this is happening but let me turn off my video for for the time being just give me a second yeah i'll just try and re um, change my location and and see if that works better Um, sorry, guys, we're just trying to get Darren on a different network. He'll be back in two minutes. Uh, till then, if you have any questions, you can post uh, uh, some of your questions here. Um, let me see if I have missed any questions. Uh, one person had asked me, uh, I think, uh, Ed, uh, what should be the timeline uh, of the business plan? How many years should it cover? One year, three year or five years? Uh, my recommendation is to cover five years because that's usually the timeline uh, of a fund uh, to stay invested in a company. So the suggestion is to cover for five years, but we also get a lot of companies who cover three years. That's, that's okay as well, but five years is preferable. Um, uh, uh, Uday had asked, uh, how should we get our idea validated uh, and have the right pitch before we go to investors? Uh, there are chances that idea is great, but pitch is not good. Uh, in my experience, in majority of the cases, so there, uh, ideas are great, but uh, the communication of that idea is not good because you have to understand the the person, the investor sitting on on the opposite end. They don't have as much depth in that area as you do, and I think a lot of founders just uh, just assume that okay, they know and they they. they very superficially communicate what they're pl planning to do. I, I recommend uh, spend good time in storytelling. I think for especially for introverts, it, it gets a little difficult. So if you're an introvert, maybe go for storytelling classes, read books on storytelling. How do you make it exciting for, for somebody who's hearing your story? Uh, bring personal elements in, bring examples in. So yeah, so... You're right. Uh, most of the time, idea is great, pitch is not, but that's a very solvable problem uh, that can be worked on. And I wish you good luck in working on it. Um, I uh, Shivansh has asked what uh, I would like to know more about the asset approach towards valuation. What's the logic behind it? Um, I mean. Uh, theoretically, asset-based valuation is basically just valuing the company on the asset it owns. So for a startup, that, that ends up being zero because mostly it's a bunch of guys. Um, asset-based is not future-looking valuation. It's basically on what you have uh, on your balance sheet. I hope that answers the question. So no, in case of startups, we don't do start uh, asset-based valuation at all. Uh, valuation of startups is more on the future potential of the company. Uh, what kind of returns can it generate? What kind of market is it addressing? What's the quality of the promoters? Darren, are you back? Yes, I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes, right. yes. Here. you're clear. Can you hear me? Clear, right? Yeah. All right. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, so I was at valuation, right? I was just explaining pre-money valuation, post-money valuation. Uh, so the pre-money, I'll repeat again, is, is actually the value of your company as it is today uh, before the investment is actually coming into your business. The post-money valuation is actually 
pre-money valuation plus the investment amount that's being raised, right? Uh, uh, we were discussing earlier about uh, the approaches to valuation. Um, to be honest, for early stage businesses, these approaches actually don't check out. Uh, it is a discussion between the entrepreneur and the invent and the investor that actually arrives that you, that 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 brings one to the valuation. Um, and there are several several sort of considerations uh, taken into course when you're when when one's doing that. The first one is, uh, you know, how much dilution should the should the should the entrepreneur have, and and is it too much at this stage uh, to keep the entrepreneur motivated going forward? Because you must understand that businesses will continue to raise capital, and there will be successive dilutions in around two, three, and four, whatever you want to call it, Series B, Series C, whatever, right? So, so. An investor will always keep that in mind uh, as to, you know, is it, are we diluting the founders too much for them to be motivated to run the business going forward? Uh, the other thing the investors would, would also want to keep into, in, in, in mind is, are we getting a meaningful stake in this business? Uh, and, and meaningful, by meaningful, we mean, uh, do we have the necessary rights to, to, to safeguard the investment? Uh, obviously, with five percent, three percent, etc., you really don't have those rights, right? So, so things like those will be discussion points, and and then you have to then what what, what would happen is you you'd sort of arrive at a middle ground if if you're not too far away from each other's expectations, right? So these approaches are used, uh, but in early stage businesses where there is no EBITDA, how would you? How would you use an EBITDA multiple, right? The business isn't profitable as yet. Uh, similarly, how would you use a revenue multiple if the revenues are really minuscule, right? If you use the market's revenue multiple, say for example, uh, you know, e-commerce companies, the revenue multiples range from one times to can to, to four times. So, so if you use that multiple for a very early stage business, uh, you would not reach at any value. Uh, uh, really, right? So, so some of these approaches don't really check out in in, in early stage businesses, just because uh, there is no fundamentals in place. Even for the DCF method, uh, your cash flows cash flows for an early stage business business isn't predictable, right? So you can't really predict the cash flows of a, of an early stage business. So how would you? There is absolutely no logic then using the the DCF method. Right. So I'm just going to open a few uh, messages on chat, um, figure out if there are any questions on this. All right, so some of you want it on full screen. So hopefully this is, this makes it much more visible. All right, so so that's about valuation. The next thing, the next clause that's important for for one to understand is also anti-dilution. And Divya was alluding to this earlier in her presentation. It's not always about going for the highest valuation that you can sort of achieve in in, in a funding round, right? Because the investor of that round is always going to have an anti-dilution clause in there, and the anti-dilution clause basically prepare, protects investors from a future down round which means if the next round or the subsequent round is raised at a valuation that's lower than the previous round, then the investor needs to be compensated for that, right? Uh, and, in, 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 and there are two ways to compensate that in, the investor in, in, in that situation. Uh, one is the full ratchet method, uh, wherein the price of the, of the new round is adjusted to the lowest price uh, the price of the investor is adjusted to the lowest price of, of, of the new round, right? So, so the investor actually maintains his or her stake in the business uh, without actually putting new capital. So there are additional shares allocated to the investor to protect the investor from being diluted because there has been a down round. Uh, and on the other, the other method is the average, weighted average method, wherein the the price is adjusted and, and, and arrived at 
which is an average of the previous price and the current price, right? So you try and negotiate these things. Uh, you might see the full ratchet in there. You, you negotiate with the investor and try and, and include the weighted average, but there's no way uh, in, in most cases you're going to escape the anti-dilution clause. So there's going to be an anti-dilution clause in almost all of the term sheet. And which is why Divya was mentioning earlier, it's not always the best deal to, to push yourself to get the highest possible valuation, right? Because say in the future, the business you know, goes through a few hiccups, you're not able to raise uh, capital at, the, at, a, at a valuation higher than the, and then the previous round, then your anti-dilution is going to kick in and then you're going to actually have to compensate your previous investors uh, by issuing additional shares and that's going to dilute you further. Right, so, so you need to be mindful about uh, you know finding that right mix of valuation for your company, and an anti-dilution is something that will protect the investor uh, in case of a future down round. Uh, the other important one is to 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 know uh, is the is the liquidation preference. Uh, investors enter into a company uh, with certain preferential rights. Uh, and this is also uh, a clause that protects the investor in case of an unfavorable liquidation event. Uh, so what are liquidation events? Uh, liquidation events could be dilution of the, uh, dissolution of the company, winding down of the company or a merger uh, and an acquisition of the company as well, right? And in case of uh, winding down of a company, the investor wants to know whether he or she can retrieve the capital or recover the capital that they've invested in the business. And the liquidation preference actually gives the investor that right to, to sort of recover that capital. Usually it is between one and a, one X to, to two X of the investment amount. Some, some investors can even go, uh, actually add three X, but you need to be careful and, and, and identify that and, and actually point that out in the term sheet and negotiate it down to the best uh, possible case for your own business. Right, um, and and it's important to understand why the investor needs the liquidation preference in there. Right, uh, investors, as as we mentioned earlier as well, raise capital from institutions, other H and I's, etc., and they have a fiduciary responsibility to return that capital. Uh, most investors do, uh, and and in that case, they want to be assured that even in a case of winding down. Or, or a dissolution of the company, that capital can be returned by the business, right? And, and so they can return the capital to their own investors. So, so the liquidation preference is really important for, for the investors to, to sort of have it in the term sheet. The, the, key, the thing that you should look out for is this uh, participating sort of preference uh, that an investor would have uh, and, and just look out for that in your term sheets. Uh, what that allows the investor to do is to, to get their in investment amount back plus participate in, in additional proceeds that are remaining uh, with the company after all the, all the you know, creditors, et cetera, have been paid out. So, so in the hierarchy of paying off uh, stakeholders, how does that work? So once there is a liquidation event, if there's a dilute, is if there's a disillusion or a winding up of the company, uh, the hierarchy starts with your creditors first. So the banks, et cetera, who, who you've taken loans need to be repaid first. Then uh, you have, uh, you know, you have to settle uh, folks that you've sort of sourced material from, et cetera, right? And then comes the investors. So there's a hierarchy and, and the investors that have invested capital will, will, will figure first before other shareholders like the founders or the employees, et cetera. So the investors will actually have a preferred uh, sort, of, sort of exit before the, uh, the owners and the employees. Uh, if there are no questions, I can stop here and, 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 and take a few questions uh, if, if there are questions on the first three uh, clauses that I've explained. If there are no questions, then I can move to the next one. Uh, 
All right. Uh, so the next one is promoter lock-in investing. Uh, this is an important one again for investors. Uh, it's because the investors actually betting on the on on the entrepreneurial team, right? So they are we are actually betting on the team. I can you hear me? All right. All right, so this is an important one for investors because the the decision to invest in an early stage business largely resides on the on the strength of the team, and we want this team to actually carry out the business plan, uh, the scale up plan, etc. And without this team, this business is actually nothing, right? So uh, it's great. We while investors are inv evaluating businesses, they do invest. They, evaluate the size of the market, the potential, the customer sentiment, et cetera. But a lot of the analysis or, or the lot of the investment thesis based on the team and because of which the investors would want the team to actually be locked into the business. Uh, so what happens here is that the investors stipulate that the team cannot share uh, sell their shares in the company or the founding team cannot sell their shares in the company for a particular period of time. And this can range from four years to even sometimes till the investor holds shares in the company. Uh, and you need to negotiate that. So it can be negotiated down to, to as I say, four years, three years, uh, depending on your, on your negotiation power with the investors. Uh, along with the lock-in comes another rider, which is, which is the vesting clause. Uh, and vesting essentially means the shares become yours after they have vested over a particular period, right? So, say for example, uh, you know your lock-in period is four years, and and you have uh, a vesting schedule that says 25% of the shares of the founders get get vested after every every year of uh, of after every year is completed of the investment being deployed in the business, right? So the first year after completing of one year, only 25% of your shares will be actually resting with you. And then in the second year, you'll have another 25, which is 50. And the reason for that is because if for, for, if for instance, um, you know, there is some level of fraud, the, the founders are not performing uh, to the to the level of expectations, uh, there is uh, there is misalignment with the business plan, etc. Uh, and the founders may have to sort of leave the business or may have to, in in some case, be terminated. Then the shares that are vested, that are unvested, are actually transferred back into the company, and the vested shares stay with with the promoters. Right. So so vesting schedules actually are even there for for. In, in the in the case of ESOPs, when you're giving out shares to, to employees, those those shares also have a schedule for vesting because you don't want those shares to sort of vest on day one, uh, and because you want the 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 employee or in the case of the promoters to be to be be invested in the business long term and deliver on performance as well. I did see a few questions pop up, and this let me take that. So for liquidation preference, uh, you know, to be honest, the ideal case scenario for uh, for entrepreneurs is to ask for one X. Um, and I'm not saying that you would always get that because it's a negotiation piece. Uh, you, you, it depends on on the level of risk the investor is taking, the stage at which they're coming into the business, the stage at, stage at which the business uh, metrics have been validated, et cetera. And, and, and depending on that, investors actually set the liquidation preference a multiple. It, it as I said, can range from one to three, uh, one to two, uh, but ideally for entrepreneurs, you would want to negotiate that down to one. All right, so we come to the right of first offer and the right of first refusal. Uh, so the right of first offer is essentially the, a right that resides with founders. Um, when an investor wants to sell shares in the company, the founders have the right to actually uh, 
offer to 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 purchase those shares and actually set a price for those shares um in many cases this is actually used this right is actually used by investors to to set a benchmark or or, or a price benchmark for the price uh, so they they say they want to sell the shares they serve a notice to the founders saying that there is x amount of shares that need to be sold the founders make an offer uh quoting a particular price and then the investors have the option to to take that price or even go to the market or go outside and find another buyer for their shares either at the same price or slightly higher but it's always uh if it's there in your in your sha uh, and in your term sheet the founders will have the right to actually have the first um option to buy those shares it's not an obligation but you have uh, it is a it is an option and similarly when uh, founders are looking to sell uh, shares uh, their shares the investors have the right to to purchase those shares the first right to purchase those shares at a price that uh, you know that is offered by the by the founders um, the founders can have a third party that is willing to buy those shares and investors can investors can then match that price if they are able to match that price then the shares technically have to be sold sold to the investors the investors can't match those that price by the third party then it's it's actually sold to the third party right um and this is in this is uh provisions provided to to the founders and investors when there they there needs to be liquidity for e- either party uh if the founders need liquidity cash for any you know household expenses etc whatever is going on in their lives they can do this and obviously these kick in for founders only after the lock in period has expired right so you before the lock in you aren't allowed to sell share your shares in the company uh unless there is a really sort of a pressing need for liquidity and an investor can make a you know make give you the option to sell a few shares for that to to to, to cover that liquidity crisis uh you wouldn't be able to share uh, sell shares in a company before the uh, the lock in period is sort of expired um the next set of rights is uh, is something that's negotiated down to the t uh, these are actually the most negotiated rights in in a term sheet and of course further on in the sha as well they call affirmative voting rights and they're they're essentially in place to ensure that some of the control uh, of the company resides with the investors as well obviously investors don't want to run day to day operations so tomorrow you want to buy a computer etc they don't want to vote on those on that on on issues like those but on key issues where you're hiring you know a cfo or you're hiring a coo or you're getting rid of a cfo or you're getting rid of a ceo you're getting rid of a co-founder those are key issues uh, that need to have the affirmative vote of the investors and uh, i've listed a few of 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 a few examples of what these these key voting matters would be on so for example as i mentioned appointment and removal bill, removal of key personnel is typically uh, you know an affirmative voting right for investors obviously issuance of new shares Or, or 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 you're going in for raising additional debt in the business you want to have ex, a large capex spend etc as i mentioned if you want to buy a laptop you want to buy a tv things like that you want to buy furniture in the business for your office etc obviously investors are not going to vote on that but say for example you're setting up a new plant and you need to invest a sizable amount of capital in in that plant then investors have the right to vote on 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 either taking that action or not right and and these as i for pretty obvious reasons they are going to be the most negotiated parts of the term sheet um, because they are control control rights and investors want to have some level of control on um, you know very key business issues all right uh, so we move to this is the last one that we have uh, so the exit rights are also so fundamental to a term sheet uh, most commercial investors would require an exit in a particular time frame uh, this can range between 60 months and 72 months that's 5 to 6 years and that's the exit period where you would an investor would try 
you know, different options to exit the business, uh, try and get a strategic sale uh, done. Um, you know, a management can also buy out the company if it's a it's a really, really cash positive business and, and it's throwing up a lot of cash and the business can actually buy out the investors. And obviously there's I, there's an option for IPO as well, but these are, these are you know, one in a one in hundred sort of uh, probabilities. But uh, the key to, to, to understand in the exit rights is that, uh, you know, investors have to exit. Most of them always will have to exit and the timeline will will depend on the kind of investor because it's largely between five and uh, five and six years and then if all these options are tried out you've tried a strategic sale you've tried to go in for a merger you've tried to try to get a management to buy it out and or you've even tried the ipo and none of it has worked then there is a clause that an investor can enforce which is called the drag clause uh, where they can enforce that the founders are sell their, their share in the, in the company to a buyer that the investor has sort of identified, right? Uh, and there's no way the founder can, can sort of refuse to do that because this right gives the investors, uh, um, gives, gives the investors to be able to drag the founders and, 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 and force that they sell to, to a buyer that the investors have identified. Now this can have have variants as well. There can be only a promoter drag or a, or a founder drag, where you're only dragging the founders and 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 not the other shareholders. Or there can be a full drag as well. You you drag every other shareholder in the business, and every other shareholder also has to sell to to the identified identified buyer, right? Uh, this is this is a standard clause. It is looks scary, but it's it's as I said, investors are in in the business of investing capital and returning capital, and that's their business, right? So they need they need really to to sort of exit a business and return the capital that they have raised from 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 in, from their own investors. So so this right is a non-negotiable. It's going to be there in almost all term sheets issued by commercial investors. So so just just don't 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 be scared by it. Um, it. It's something that you have to be aware of uh, before you actually, you know, sign on to, to 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 or agree to want to raise capital from, you know, venture capital investors or private equity investors. You just need to be aware that 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 these investors will need to exit the business at some point in time. Uh, so that's all I had. Uh, what I could do is take a few questions right now. Um, and what I can do right now is also share, um, can also share a link to a, to a demo term sheet if you would, if you would want to sort of look at this and just have a, have a read through. Um, it captures all the basic clauses that I've sort of, um, you know, I've sort of explained through my presentation, but also has additional clauses. Um, we can take about three or four minutes for you guys to read through some of these clauses. Uh, and if there are some questions pertaining to some of these clauses, feel free to sort of put them down. Uh, and I'm happy to answer them to the best of my ability. So we'll take two minutes to, to sort of, I mean, two minutes is a little too short to sort of read such a comprehensive document, but uh, unfortunately don't have too much time. So take two minutes to sort of read through some of this. And, uh, you know, if there, is, if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to sort of address any of them pertaining to the terms in this term sheet. But this is what broadly a term sheet would look like. And these are broadly the, sh the, the terms that would be captured in a term sheet you would see from, from a commercial investor. Yeah. 
So on board seats, it's again, it's something up for discussion. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, it, it depends on also on the investment amount. It depends on if it's a if it's a it's a co-investment round. Uh, if there are two investors participating on the round, etc. Right. So, say for example, it's a four million dollar round, and there are two investors both investing um, both investing two million each. Now, both of these investors would want to have uh, board seats, right? Uh, both of these investors would want to have board seats just because they, they are investing the same amount of capital, taking the same risks, et cetera. Uh, so what one could do here is actually reconstitute the board uh, to make it a sort of a neutral board. You have two seats allocated to the two investors. You have two seats allocated to, to the founders and maybe one seat allocated to an independent. So the board is neutral. Uh, you have two investors uh, that are represented by, by, the, two, um, by, the, by the two investors represent the investors and um, the two founders represent the founders and there's an independent that's mutually sort of nominated to the board by both the founders and the investors, right? So, so the board is then neutral. The board can the board composition can be sort of reconstituted uh, to be able to ensure the board is sort of neutral and is not you know tilted in either the favor of the investors or the favor of the favor of the entrepreneurs. Also, one small point here: uh, apart from uh, board seats, there are seats for board of those also, so you can play with that as well. Uh, if you think one investor has a, a relatively less share holding, uh, you can go with a board observer seat rather than a board seat. Yeah. And the observer is allowed to sort of participate in the meeting, can can attend the meeting, can, can sometimes make comments during the meeting as well, the board meeting, but it's not allowed to vote, but it gives the investor the comfort that they're at least participant to the discussions at the board level. Any other questions regarding the, the presentation or if you've been able to browse through this document quickly, any questions on this? Right, I think uh, if there aren't any questions, okay. okay. So a convertible note uh, is essentially uh, issued by investors that uh, that really don't want to put a price to, to a round um, because as I mentioned earlier, right? The fundamentals of the business aren't in place. So you don't have EBITDA, you don't have proper sizable revenue, you don't have, you can't really value that business, right? So, so they they tend to to defer the value valuation of the business to the next round, in the hope that, you know, in the course of maybe 12 months or 18 months, the business will be able to actually demonstrate some sales, demonstrate some traction, and so. The next round can actually be the next round valuation can actually be done in a scientific manner, uh, and so investors issue a convertible note. Uh, they are typically these notes are typically raised in in the early stages of the business, or in in a time where the the Series A round is sort of running running dry and you're running out of capital and you just need a bridge to the next round. Uh, need say $500,000 or, or five or six crores just to sort of get you to the next round because the fundamentals of the business already are in place. 
business is growing, metrics are in good shape, uh, and you just need additional capital to just tide over to to the next round. So convertibles come in either at the start of the business or in between two two rounds, uh, just to just to take take out the the whole pricing issue of the of the round. Uh, and, and usually convertibles will have to be converted uh, at the next round. Uh, there is a qualifying, uh, something that they call as a qualified round, um, and it will be specified in the terms of the, of the convertible. So if the next round is about a $4 million round, et cetera, and it, it breaches the qualifying threshold, then the convertible will need to be converted. Uh, So the number, the convertible uh, is always, there's always uh, a discount attached to the convertible and a floor and a ceiling also put 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 in into the round. They, they serve as sort of uh, quasi or, you know, for the time being valuation ranges. Uh, so the flow will be set at a, whatever the flow is, it could be 5 million or 2 million and then there will be a ceiling. And there's also a discount to, to, to to the to the route for these investors right so so then the convertible terms will have all of these clauses they will have it will have a floor it will have a ceiling it will have a, a discount rate that is applicable to the investor uh, obviously because the investor doesn't want to sort of uh, convert at the price of the next round right they want to convert at a price that is at a discount to the next round because they actually have taken risk uh, risk that is much higher than the next round investor because they actually committed to investing earlier right? so so all of these terms will actually be we will be covered in 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 the in the terms of the convertible note in practice drag transactions are really hard to execute um just because it goes into you know it goes into it goes into the courts of law right so it has to be uh, the the It'll go. It'll go into litigation, wherein uh, you know the the entrepreneur is actually trying to defend his or her right, uh, and the investor is trying to do, to sort of enforce their right. Uh, in in reality, if the business is actually performing really poorly, um, and and there is uh, there has been consistent uh, reductions in revenue, the team's bleeding, etc. There is not going to be a, a strategic buyer or a buyer willing to buy a business that's going down the drain, right? So, who is the investor actually going to drag the founders to? Um, if there is no buyer for that business, the investor is actually stuck with that investment and and really has to turn that investment around himself or herself. Right? So, that means getting rid of the founding team, putting in a new founding team. Taking in uh, taking another bet to actually put in more capital into the business if they if the investor feels that the business can actually be turned around, and to be honest, if the if if there is no um, visibility on on that potentially happening, turning around the business, getting the new founding team etc. in place, the investor is left with no choice but to just write off the investment um, because there is just no other buyer that is there for to buy the business out of the investor and and there is no way that they see this is see, see this as a turnaround opportunity or a turnaround possibility as well so the, the last option is to just write it off uh, obviously those that option will not be captured into the term sheet uh, because the investor doesn't want to get into a scenario wherein they're already thinking about writing off businesses right so that's just <laughs> counterintuitive to what investors need to be doing. Uh, so, so yeah, um, writing off a business is the last option, but uh, in, in all honesty, if there are, if it's not working out, then that's the only course of action. All right, so I think Alan's suggesting that we, we, we close the sessions. Uh, I thank you all for joining both uh, our sessions, Divya's and mine. Uh, I hope it's been of value to all of you. Um, and. 
if you need to reach out to us you can reach out to us uh, connect with us on umbrella and we can share some of these these resources with you uh, the, the presentation maybe and and this demo term sheet as well if you want to understand it better but thanks a lot for your time and all the best in running your businesses thank you